if we were talking about if we were talking about their defenses, I think you could see in, a, in an instant that it would be it's easy for a Fleuria colony to hide its nest, a Dorsata colony it's, you can't hide the, those big nests. Um, the other colleague that was important in this work is Pumtep Akranatul, shown here. He was my Thai host. He's also a honey bi biologist. And here over the, with this sort of movie star shot is Fred Dyer. <laughs> he did his postdoctoral studies with me. So all of the three of us or the four of us were, are, were, were the source of the information I'm gonna share with you. Where did we do our studies? We did them in Thailand and we used two study sites. Um, one study site was about a two hour drive northeast of Bangkok, uh, up in the mountains, big high mountains, wild mountains up here, at least they used to be wild, haven't been back for a long time. And one of the areas was the Khao Yai National Park. Khao Yai means big mountain national park. It's two couple, couple thousand square kilometers in area and with lots of wild areas around it. Um, and the other site, and there was a nice little field station nearby where we could live easily and do experiments. And the other site where we worked was in Northern Thailand. Back then it was a small city, a little city, very quiet city. Now I am afraid, I know it's been invaded by, become a huge tourist destination, Chiang Mai. And we needed the Chiang Mai setting because we needed, for, as you'll see, for some of these studies, we needed low ambient temperatures. And uh, we could get pretty low temperatures going up in the mountains in, in Khao Yai, but we needed even lower temperatures. So we had to go to Chiang Mai to get those. Now, to give you a sense of the study site, here's a photo of a robin looking at a nest of Apis dorsata in this Khao Yai National Park. I mentioned it's in the mountains, 200 kilometers northeast of Bangkok. And it was, it's, a, it's an amazing park. Wild elephants, white-handed gibbons, great hornbills, and all three, all three species. I know there, I know the species are there are more taxonomists to find more species than just these three now, probably in, the, in this park. And we did see some saw some evidence of that, but I'm just going to refer to them as a, as the three species: Serrana, Dorsata, and Floria. And I think you can see that, um, well. This is a typical nesting site for dorsata here. It's up on the limb of the dead dipter carp tree. And um, pretty tough to do, pretty tough to do behavioral. Or, uh, <laughs> somebody's got to mute their microphone. <laughs> so to get access for some of the times, for some parts of the study, we needed to take the temperatures of bees, their, measure their thorax temperatures, and that's one of the, and that was another reason for going to Chiang Mai. Those dorsata colonies tend to nest high up. And um, when they nest high up on a building like here, uh, fortunately you can get high up right with them and, um, and sweep, sweep returning foragers out of the air and quickly take their temperatures. So Chiang Mai offered easier access than the getting up in the tall trees in the, in the Khao Yai Park. Now, where did this study start? <laughs> I'm going to walk you through it step by step uh, to show you how it evolved because it unfolded in a way that was quite, uh, which, which unex was unexpected. Our first study was sort of a classical, I don't know, biological study. You've got animals of different sizes and you're interested in some feature of their biology and you want to see how does size affect that how does size affect that? And what we were interested in uh, was their thermal biology, among other things. And so uh, we would, uh, first study was just to measure the thorax temperatures upon arrival at the nest for at variant ambient temperatures for all, for the three species of Asian honeybees that were there um, in, uh, in Thailand. And we expected a, the standard relationship between body mass and temperature thorax over a range of temperatures. You know, this, the bigger the bee, the, the hotter it should be, the medium-sized bee 
should be medium sized thorax temperatures and little b um, low thorax temperatures, like, you know, three bears and Goldilocks to three bears. Uh, the bigger the, well, the expectation was, the bigger the bee, the higher th the thorax temperature. Um, and, and our method of measuring the temperatures is the grab and stab method. You quickly snag the bee with an insect net and while it, and in, in within a, a second or so, you insert a thermocouple needle, needle probe into the bee's thorax. And you do this when she's just coming home to the nest, finishing a foraging flight. And we got results that didn't match our expectations completely, it was not the expected relationship between body mass and temperature thorax. Here's, here's a plot of some of the data. So here we on the x-axis is the ambient temperature. And some of it make, was exactly as we expected. As the temperature, as the ambient temperature went up, the bees came back with hotter thorax temperatures. Uh, they, as the ambient temperature goes up, they don't shed heat as quickly. So they come home with phloreas, came home with hotter temperatures as the ambient temperature. And that's this, that was the same for dorsata. The higher the ambient temperature, the higher the uh, thorax temperature. And same with serrana. So that wasn't, the, 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 the slopes of those curves weren't, weren't surprising. But what was surprising was the relationship. We see that serrana, it's the intermediate sized B, but at every temperature, it's the it comes back with the hottest thoracic temperatures. So that was weird. We expected fluoria to be lowest, dorsata to be highest. Well, dorsata was higher than fluoria, but it's not as high as, didn't, doesn't fly as hot as serrana. And so this was our first sign of an abnormal, quote unquote, abnormal relationship between body mass and flight temperature. Hmm, what did that, what was that about? So we didn't make, we looked a little deeper. Um, our step two was to <clears throat> determine the minimum ambient temperature at which a worker bee of each species was able to fly to a highly attractive sugar water feeder. And we found that Fluoria, the little bee, the 23 milligram bee, worker body size, um, it couldn't, couldn't get out, out to that food until it was, the air had warmed to over 20 degrees centigrade. Apis dorsata, the really big one, yeah, it could do it at 15 degrees C, but Apis serrata, the intermediate one, it had no trouble getting out there, um, way down to 10 degrees centigrade. And look at these body mass differences. These are big, 23 milligrams, 118 milligrams, and 44 milligrams. And yet this 44 milligram B is, is somehow flying at the lowest, is able to forage at these low, low temperatures. Well, low, you know, comparatively low. Certainly not the usual relationship between insect body size and then in flight temperature. So that was interesting. It was also very puzzling or intriguing. <laughs> so we looked, we kept, so we wasn't, with it, our plan wasn't to explore this aspect of the bee's biology, but it's what, it's where the data steered us to. And let's look at it visually. <clears throat> okay, here's a plot, body mass, x-axis. So make it to keep it linear, it's a, a log, log, log plot or log linear plot, temperature over here. And here's our fluoria, small body mass, low um, elevation of temperature on average, or go back to this line. If, it's about it's about five degrees. It keeps its its thorax is about five degrees above ambient. And these other ones, it's a higher temperature above ambient. That's what's plotted in this plot. Temperature above ambient. So the temperature difference between the thorax and the ambient. And Fluoria, the little bee, is down here, and it's it's got a low, about a five degree elevation over ambient. Dorsata is the big bee, uh, way over here, but. And it's it's warmer, but it's only about ten degrees above ambient. The the really hot bees are are is the serrana bee, which is intermediate. It's 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 again it's a logarithmic scale. It's about fifteen degrees above ambient. And here's the mellifera. It can it can it's even hotter. Um, 
But the best way to look at this plot is this way. Just to connect the two, the, the just connecting the dots for the open nesting species and the cavity nesting species. And you can see the slopes of these lines are really, they're, they're parallel. So it's the same slope. And what we're seeing then is, is a shift. Somehow there's a shift Regard this, this is a way of visualizing the difference without thinking about the body size. If there were open nesting species of the same body sizes as mellifera, or uh, we would um, probably see temperatures, their body the thorax temperatures down here. But no, it's it shifted up for that, for a given body size, the uh, thorax temperatures, the thorax temperature elevation above ambient is shifted upward when arriving at a feeder. And I should say that's the, I want to stress again, the feeder was, I think, 400 meters away. So it's a long flight out to the food. So here's the key finding so far, this dichotomy between the two pairs of species, the open nesting species, the workers have relatively low thoracic temperature elevations during flight. In the cavity nesting species, the workers have relatively high thoracic temperature elevations during flight. And this begs the question, how come? And when we say how come, as biologists, we have two general ways of answering this question, or two, to, two general dimensions of answering this question. One is the proximate perspective. How, what are the mechanisms? In this case, are there differences in heat loss or heat production or both that can explain why the cavity nesting species can fly hotter? And then there's also the ultimate question, why? What's the adaptive significance of workers being different in their thoracic temperatures during flight? Why do the, why, why do the cavity nesting bees fly, it, fly with them? Um, the ability to fly with high thoracic temperatures and thus fly at low, at low ambient temperatures. Well, one possible explanation from a pers proximate perspective is that, well, maybe that Saran and Mellifera have better thoracic insulation than Fluria and Dorsata. That could certainly explain it. That's, that's, that's the obvious explanation. So, uh, so we looked at this. And the way we looked at it was very low tech. <laughs> we just made, we just got made cooling curves for each, you take a bee, a dead bee. And this is really, I wanna stress, this is, all of this is, it looks sort of fancy, but it's very low tech. You take a bee, take a dead bee, freshly killed bee, you, Put your, we put our little thermocouple needle in the bee, in her thorax, deep centered in her thorax, and then you heat up the bee under a lamp. And then to a standard temperature. And then you just, well, Fred would, um, was, let's see, how, what was our arrangement of work? Oh yeah, Fred would read the thermometer at, at every 15 seconds. We'd turn off the, we'd heat the bee's thorax up till it got nice and hot, um, 22 degrees above ambient. And then Fred would turn the lamp off. And then every 15 seconds, he would, he would take the reading. He'd call out the reading from the ther uh, thermocouple thermometer and I'd write it down. And so that's, there's no fancy, you know, recording device or anything like that. And no, not even a very fancy um, temperature probe. But it, the results were very, very clear. And these are the cooling curves. They're just exactly the shape you expect for the, the, the cooling of an object like this. And you can see that Fluria cools very quickly. Um, and Dorsata cools relatively slowly and serrano mellifera cool right in the middle. So that's exactly what you predict by body mass. So um, the cooling curves differ if the thoracic insulation is the same. So there's no, there's no sign here of the, of the uh, cavity nesting bees having any better thoracic insulation. And this tells us that 
This told us that Saronid and Mellifer are able to fly with these hotter thoraces because they're producing more heat. They have a higher mass specific heat production. More watts of energy is being, per kilogram, is being uh, produced. They don't, so they have higher heat production, mass specific heat production, not better, it's more insulation. Okay, this begs the question, how come? Why did why do they why do they run hotter? Oh, and here's some other another way to say it per, more precisely. Um, these are the values of, of the mass specific heat production at 25 degrees centigrade, the watts per kilogram of of uh, per kilogram of thorax mass for fluoria. It's about 400 watts per kilogram. Surat and Dorsat about 300. 50 watts per kilogram, Serrata, 700 watts per kilogram, and for uh, Apis Miller for about 650. Um, we have a draft situation which cooled things off faster and that led to a rather low reading. Without the draft, we get a better reading, 640. And again, I, I wanna stress that the only piece of, pieces of scientific equipment that were needed to get these values were just sensitive scales for measuring the weights of the bees' thoraces and a digital thermometer equipped with a thermocouple probe. Other, you might think, oh, you need a fancy apparatus to, to make these heat production measurements or metabolic rate, mass-specific heat production measurements. No, it's just, it's just calculated from the cooling curves and knowing the weights of the thoraces. So yeah, we need a scale, sensitive scales low tech, but revealing. So let's take a recap of what we've seen so far. We've seen that these, if we look across these four species of honeybees, there's a dichotomy in nesting behavior and worker physiology. The high powered bees nest in cavities and the low powered bees nest in the open. And this means that the low, and we've seen that the low powered bees need warmer temperatures uh, uh, to fly than do the high powered bees. The Floria, uh, Serrana, uh, let's see. Yeah, Dorsata can go to, uh, Floria needs 20 degrees centigrade is about its minimum temperature it can fly. Dorsata can go down to 15 degrees centigrade, but Mellifera and, and Serrana, they can go down to 10 degrees centigrade and they can fly just fine out at, at 10 degrees centigrade and even lower. So the puzzle, two puzzles. How does this difference in power output per unit thorax, thorax mass arise? And this is a very good question for physiological analysis, which we were not equipped to do. And, but there's a second puzzle. What's the adaptive basis of this dichotomy? And this is the one where we could, as field biologists, we could make some, some headway. So that's what we're gonna look at now. It's puzzle two, what's the adaptive basis of this dichotomy between cavity nesting bees and open nesting bees in terms of their the heat production or uh, metabolic activity of their flight muscle. Well, it helps, at least I find it helpful to, to, to build a table that gives us these comparisons. So let's go through it line by line. Okay, and this is really, I think the best way for me to explain it. Line one is workers, how many workers in a colony per comb cell? Well, we see some very interesting comparisons here. For Fleury and Dorsada, there's one worker per, about one point, a little more than one, one and a quarter or so workers per comb cell. With Serrata and Mellifera, <clears throat> we know from dissecting their nests and collecting the colonies and measuring the nests and counting the bees, that it's only 0 0.28 to 0 0.25 bees per comb cell, worker bees per comb cell. And that's not surprising because when we look at a Fleuria and a Dorsata colony, we don't see the comb. We see it covered with a blanket of bees. Sometimes it can be a thick blanket. And that's why we get these high numbers of workers per comb cell. So, okay, why do we have so many more workers per comb cell in these species? Well, it's, we'll come back to that. It's insulin keeping the nest warm. There's also another related big difference 
brood per worker bee, it's very low in Fleuria. We don't have any data on this that I know of for Dorsada. So you folks there in Bangalore, if you can get some data on the brood per worker in a, in a colony in Dorsada, this is not a trivial challenge, I realize, but it would be very interesting to know, to, you know and I bet it's of something like Fleuria, down like Fleuria. Whereas with Saran and Mellifera in the summer, not, you know, in the winter uh, for Mellifera, it's about, it's 1.88 to 1.77. So much about three times as high, higher than than, Fleur, than we saw with Fleuria. So these bees cover their combs, Serrana and Mellifera, the cavity nesters, the combs are covered thinly, but they rear a lot of brood per worker. Uh, they don't, the species don't differ in the egg to adult time for worker development. They're all around 20, 21 days. And we could we could use better data on that for Dorsada too, because the literature, the numbers are wide range widely. And maybe that is the reality, but maybe it's more data would give us a better estimate. Another thing that we would really need information about is longevity. When we did for Fred and I would mark newly emerged Fleuria on nests and we would just watch them. But we were only, we weren't there for month after month after month. You know, I think it was seven months maximum during the two stays. Um, and the longest we could, we saw that bees, we saw bees living 50 more and more days. Fleuria workers were living 50 plus days. Again, dorsata, no data, rats. And there's a lot of evidence in above from, studies done in India and other in Pakistan and other places of Serrana. It's less than most workers are live fewer than 38 days in mellifera. Again, in the summer, it's 30 to 40 days, sometimes even less than that. So different lifespans. Uh, looks like there's probably different longevity between the open nesting and cavity nesting bees. And there's a big difference. Um, there's, Again, the evidence for Fleury and Dorsada is, is sparse, um, but if you for trips per forager per day, it's low, very low for Fleury and Dorsada, at least under the in the studies that were done. Whereas we know it's Serrana and Mellifera, it's it and during if the foraging conditions are good, it can be um, 15, 20, or even more. And as we've seen, the Calculations from the cooling curves tell us that the mass specific metabolic rate um, and, uh, and the flight speed, which we were able to measure in, in Thailand, is those things are low in Fleuria and Orsada, but high in Serrana and Mellifera. I should put it, I should have put the flight speeds in here, but I didn't. But yeah, it's these guys, <laughs> these guys fly a lot faster than these ones. And those of you that have watched Pluria and, and Dursada, you'll, you'll know that they fly rather slowly. So stepping back from those details, what we're, what we're seeing is that Pluria and Dursada have five times more bees per cell per unit comb area than Serrana and Mellifera. And why is that? It's for, Almost certainly, it's for better protection from the cold and rain and predators because their nests, their combs are out in the open. And curtains, so I think it's fair to say that these curtains, these protective curtains that Fleuria and Dorsada produce are costly in terms of labor, in terms of bodies of bees. And how do they get five times more bees per cell? Well, they don't shorten the development time. They don't crank out the bees faster, but they, they do things that lengthen the adult longevity, the low flight activity, um, and probably other things as well. Uh, we just, we need more data about, about these things. And these low um, metabolic rates, lingering on the nest, things like that, where, take, where they don't go out and if you don't start um, foraging uh, until later in life, that would also increase the, the worker's longevity. Um, so this need for increased longevity looks like this is constrained Fleuria and Dorsada to low temperature existences. 
assuming there's a link between flight activity, um, just general metabolic activity and the longevity of workers. And th that's true if you look across species within a certain kind of, across mammals and other things, that's true as a general biological pattern. And it looks like it's gonna be hold up here for the honeybees as well. So in thinking about the adaptive basis of this dichotomy um, of all of these dimensions of these two dichotomies between the open nesting and cavity nesting, I think you can see there's some interesting things going on here, but a lot more mysteries that should be um, examined more closely. So what I called this talk, A Tale of Four Species, but maybe I better talk title, though it would give it away, is it's really a tale of two ways to run a colony, to run a honeybee colony. So again, now that we've looked at these measurements and things, I think we can appreciate these pictures even more. Now here we've got a mellifera colony. I've removed uh, the, the bees off this, off this combs, both of these, so it's a little bit misleading. But if I hadn't um, taken the bees off these combs, they would be, they'd have a monolayer of bees on them. But over here, Fleuria nest, big thick coating of bees, jacket covering of bees on the combs, and dorsata, same sort of thing. So two very different ways of running a colony. And the way the indications are that, that the way they can get these heavy combs and these heavy blankets or curtains of bees is they get the bees to live a long time. And part of that is they have a low metabolic rate and probably it's also that they have a low, um, uh, low activity level, delay and foraging and long lifespan. So here's some unanswered questions for those of you that um, have access to Fleuria and Dorsata and Serrana. What are the average lifespans of Fleuria and Dorsata workers? And if you're gonna measure those, I, at the same time, in the same place, I try to get some measurements of, of Serrana work a lifespan because the lifespan often reflects the activity level. Another really important thing are, is to see, like, clarify or get, make it more certain that what are the average number of trips per forager per day in these, in these three species? The evidence and all, it's all, it's all, a lot of it's quite preliminary is that with Fleuria and Dorsata averaged over all the foragers on a colony, it's very few forager tri trips per bee per day, per forager per day. And even also really important would be to try to figure out what's the age polyethism schedule for Fleuria and Dorsata workers. And um, I know it's hard to look, and probably the best species to look at this would be Fleuria because they're not as touchy not as defensive, but I would love to know at which age bees stop, fleurial workers stop doing brood care and when they go into the curtain. And then presumably at some point they, they step out of curtain service and become foragers. And foraging is the most dangerous. So it's probably the very last thing they do in their lives. That would be a really neat thing to learn more about. And then related to that last point is this question, who are the curtain bees in Fleuria and Dorsata? Are they long-term middle-aged bees? That's my hunch, but gosh, it's just a it's just a guess. So just as we saw at the beginning of the talk, there's two different ways of being a seabird, living in a shallow scape on the ground or nesting in a deep cup, cup of mud on a cliff. There's two very different ways of being a honeybee colony cavity nesting and open nesting. And this difference, I feel, and the evidence tells me, uh, tells us, really shapes dramatically their, their biology, and it's particularly their behavioral biology and their physiology. So that's my, that's my concluding slide, I believe. Yes, it is. Um, so if, if um, I'd be happy to um, take questions and try to answer them at this point. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I think we have a few questions in the chat, but maybe we can first start with 
questions um, in person if someone has a question and would like to ask it. Um, Vidur, please go ahead. So uh, these are, I'm basically reading out what I typed in the chat. So like at times other than mass flight activity periods, is it pretty much guaranteed that any airborne bee approaching the nest is a returning forager? And two, uh, does it not matter in the temperature measurements whether the captured forager is returning with food back from an unsuccessful for, for foraging trip or back from an orientation flight? Yeah. I. I... I'll take the second question first because I can remember that one. Uh, uh, well, well, yeah, we, we did assume that the, we we don't know if there are different temperatures if the bee is coming back with forage or, or, or taking an orientation flight. So yeah, that's one. That's a that's a good question and something that that would be good to to make clear. What was the first question again? Uh, oh. Did I know whether they were foraging or, or orientation? Yeah. Or orientation? yeah. Like, uh, like I assume you made sure it wasn't during a mast flight activity. So you could pretty much be sure that like any airborne bee coming towards the nest is a forager coming back. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, these were, um, these were times when uh, the colonies were uh, there wasn't a mass flight or anything like that. It was just bees. Everything was quiet on the nest. Most of the curtain bees were very quiet, and it was just the um, just the the, re the usual traffic of bees coming back with pollen and nectar. Mm, so and basically, when a bee started coming towards the nest, I guess you uh, swiped the net before it like got too close to the nest. That's right. We used a small net, so. Um, yeah. So that we didn't make a big disturbance next to the next to the colony. That's right. Right, right. And a quick return to the second question. So I guess uh, one can I, I suppose safely assume that there's a like reasonably equal distribution between the different types of foragers I mentioned. So one can I guess assume a like random sampling between these three types of for the foragers, can one do that? In this, um, yeah, I guess it, that's true. It probably was a random sample. We were just taking any incoming bee, basically. Um, we weren't determining whether they were, we didn't, I don't believe we recorded whether the bee was carrying loads of pollen. We certainly didn't determine whether she was um, distinguished between water collectors or, or, or nectar collectors. Um, right, right. And, yeah. Yeah. So you can see there's a lot, there's, a, there's things that this, what we did was pretty, um, uh, not rough, but not, not fully detailed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then we have a question by Murugisan Twili. Please go ahead. I'm not sure if the microphone is maybe not working. Maybe we can, for the time being, move to the next question by Agnish. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Agnish. Uh, so I I'm just uh, rereading my question uh, from the chat box. So okay. uh, if insulation is not the answer, then could it be a uh, cavity is what I was thinking. Like if they have a cavity which has a more controlled environmental condition, which could be helping them retain the temperature or release the temperature when the ambient is hot versus if the ambient is cold, retain the temperatures. Yeah, compared I, I think to open ones. Yeah. yeah, it um definitely that's part of the story. The cavity walls stabilize tremendously the temperature of the nest uh, inside the, around the nest, around the bees colony, their combs and themselves. That is a big part of the story, yes. Um, it of course, it also means that, so that's one reason they don't need to cover the combs as thickly, but it, I think it's also the cavity provides a huge amount of defense 
so they don't, again, they don't need to cover, they don't need to make anything like as, as thick a protective blanket. So yeah, it's a, it's a really important question that there's, and I guess to summarize it, those thick blankets of Fleury and Arsada, their protection against predators and their protection against rain and cool temperatures. Uh, my second question was, uh, what is the hottest temperature till which uh, Serana could fly and forage at? Because uh, here in mm -hmm. India, we do see that uh, the temperatures go really high in the summers and they still forage. Uh, so yeah. Uh, if, if they are I, able to forage at 10 degrees Celsius on that other extreme, I was wondering uh, what is the highest, uh, the higher end where they could still forage? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer for you um, because where I was working, I was up in the mountains in Thailand and um, I didn't get, I didn't really see the bees working at really high temperatures. Um, but we know from Apis mellifera that even if, even if it gets above 40 degrees C, mm. they can still forage, mm. if, especially if they're collecting nectar um, and they will regurgitate some of the nectar onto their heads to keep the head cool. And, I, and somehow wow. that cools enough of the rest of the body so they can, okay. can keep working under. As long as they're flying and regurgitating some liquid, they, they, can, they can do it. It must be very hard, but... Yeah, uh, that that that's was that's what exactly was my point because if it is for Sarah at ten degrees Celsius, they're able to fly because they they are able to keep their thoracic temperatures uh, higher than the ambient. But yes. now in India at forty degrees plus, they are still able to fly. Like, what would be their thoracic temperatures there? Like, if it is going to fifty degrees or so, which will be like very critical for their physiological conditions, right? So yeah, yeah. Yeah, that it would be good. I, if, Pro probably yeah, it, the, the, the temperature above the ambient may not vary linearly. So, so while the ambient is low, probably they are keeping their thoracic temperatures way above the ambient, but at higher temperatures, it could be lower. I think you're right. Ambient. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's correct because, yeah, they can't, <laughs> they would, yeah, what is the temperature at which? the flight muscle starts to denature. I think it's 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 about 43, 45, oh, yeah. something 45, like that. Yeah. 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 So those are that's a really that's a really interesting line of thought. And it's it's um and it's as they say it was not something we were thinking about, but I can see that over much of the range of all of these bees, these very really high temperatures are something they have to deal with. It's not just dealing with yeah. low temperatures. Yeah. Okay. okay, then uh, Gart Otis has a question. Hey, Tom, hi, good to see you. Is this the Professor Gard Otis oh, from right Canada? Not far, but it is, and it is me. Um, <laughs> So I actually, you probably forgot that I did this once. I'm really bad, as you know, at publishing stuff. And uh -huh. so Zachary Huang and I still talk regularly about publishing some work we did about 30 years ago. Okay, and on good. the first big trip to Malaysia in 89, we had the opportunity to go on a honey hunting trip, honey hunting expedition, uh -huh. and the honey hunters to bring down some brood comb. And we had a couple of nests on the university campus in Malaysia that were low to the ground. So we hatched out young bees. We marked them with little numbered tags and uh -huh. fitted up a little cage that had a trap door on it that we could fit at night so we didn't disturb the bees. Uh, we could fit a string to it. And then at night, we could just uh, raise the little cage up, pull a little string and open it up so that our, mark, our young mark bees could merge and join with the the bees in the colonies. And so it. then we started to watch these like, you know, like standard, like what you do. And again, very low technology. And so in a nutshell, um, as you'd expect, all the marked bees disappeared. We, we didn't even know if it had worked at first, except we didn't find dead bees underneath the, the colony. <laughs> <laughs> because they all went in underneath and the, doing the, the activities you'd expect in with the brood area and stuff like that. So then, um, at variable points in time, these marked bees would start to emerge on the curtain. And it was really interesting because in mellifera, when you do this, you'd expect them all to start to emerge, move on to uh, 
Yeah. Like, like external activities at about the same age. The bees would move out at variable periods of time, variable lengths of time. And eventually we saw most of them actually. And um, then they would, <laughs> as you know, in Dorsata, the, four, the bees that are on the curtain are very pale in color. And then yeah. before they become foragers, the, the last abdominal segments darken and the whole beads darkens a bit. And so um, Zachary Huang was able to do some work with juvenile hormone. And we, knew, we know that that change in color is driven by juvenile hormone levels. And again, it was highly variable. So some bees would stay in the curtain for 20 days before they change color. And others would be in the curtain a few days and then change color to the darker bee and then become a, a forager. And uh, I can't remember the data. I was looking at the, the, the stuff in my office just the other day. But I think the average longevity was more of up around 40 days, which would fit with your whole <laughs> hypothesis and would fit with your data with Gloria. So that was kind of a long story, but it was... Um, uh, we do have some data, and, and he and I just the other day were talking about how desperately we need to publish the study. So I guess we better hurry up and publish it before we move on to another realm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one thing that I don't know how this relates. Well, I do know how it relates, but we know with Apis mellifera, the longevity varies greatly depending upon how much foraging activity and opportunities there are. They, if they, if they in, in August here, there's nothing to forage on, and the bees just they live longer lives because they're not going out and collecting very much. So that, that's another variable in the whole story. Do you have any sense of whether it was good foraging conditions when you did your work? Uh, no, it, they were foraging, but I don't know how well. But we do have something related to that because Nico and Gudrun Kerner had been there and they had developed this technique for cutting down combs of, or nests, entire nests of dorsata and moving them to where you could watch them. So they had fitted this very large uh, screened in cage that prevented Dorsata from flying out of the cage, but they were still mm -hmm. like, it was like a zoo cage if you want with flying screen. And yeah. they had transferred a colony into this, a Dorsata into this cage. So we also had mark bees on that colony and um, the bees, you can tell by how much pollen is coming in if they're like preparing to abscond or anything. It looked like they were getting ready to abscond. So there was a door that allowed them to forage. Well, we shut the door so they couldn't forage. And indeed, they did stop brood rearing completely. Um, and then after a period of time, they started up again. And those bees um, greatly delayed the transition to the darkened forager stage. They stayed longer in the yellow curtain stage. Um, and I don't, we don't have juvenile hormone levels for that, but it was, it looked like the same kind of thing that when they stopped foraging, they went into a quiescent phase or, or dormancy that they basically stopped aging like you'd expect in our winter bees. Yeah, and that, that's very, that mechanism is, is probably really important to Dorsada because they do go to these periods when they, at least in Thailand, they fly up into the mountains and they, they hang out. Um, uh, during the, Laboriosi, the dry had that, Laboriosi had that strategy where they fly down and <clears throat> winter in a bivouac under a log or something. They, they go several months without doing anything just above mm -hmm. freezing temperatures. So yeah, they yeah. have the mechanism. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So many. Well, so, many just, so much natural history there. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Gar. Thank you. Um, I see we have a number of people with raised hands, but maybe we can mix it up, Axel, and have a, a couple of questions from the chat as well. Okay, ask someone uh, first with a raised hand, and I'm checking it. So because okay. some of the uh, one, some of the questions have already been answered. Okay, so then maybe Margarita could be uh, could ask the next next question. I wish you could find out the Sorry about that. Go ahead, Margarita. Oh, I don't hear you. Don't know if that's... I see Margarita, but I don't hear her. Yes. 
Thank you, have your mic muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning, so you mentioned in, uh, in the very first slides, so there is massive differences in uh, worker size, and then you mentioned there is massive differences in longevity. And my question is, uh, how does this translate to queen worker relationship and to the whole idea of reproductive skew? Whether there is also differences in queen size between the species, differences in uh, queen size to worker size ratio, like are queens massively bigger than the workers or have a different development time from the workers? And- uh, Thank you, for, yeah, that's a really, that's a really, I'm glad you asked that question because it's something I meant, I meant to mention. We look, as we looked across these three Asian species, or four species, if you include mellifera, you'll find a, I think approximately six-fold or five or six-fold ratio of, of body masses of the workers from the smallest species to the largest. But when you look at the queens, the queens are, there's only a two-fold range. The, the Floria queens look really large compared to the workers. And the Dorsata queens don't look terribly large compared to the workers. So most of this evolution of size difference is in the, is in the workers. To, which is interesting. And, uh, I haven't really thought much about it, except that that's the, that is the pattern. And it, it does suggest though that selection has been primarily upon, well, the size of the workers, the ones that actually do most of, most of the, the activity and deal with the environment directly. Uh, but uh, what about reproductive skew? Because again, in the Apis melif at least. Yeah, I don't, we didn't look at that at all, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. We weren't, you know, that's a, it's an interesting question because I don't think the term reproductive skew had even been coined back in the 70s when we were doing this work. Yeah. Uh, my rationale for asking this is that, you know, in the Apis mellifera, the narrative goes that uh, the workers who are less likely to reproduce, who are more likely, who, yeah. are, who have gone into this physiological state of uh, complete infertility, high driven yeah. hormone, low vitalogenin, all that, they go to be foragers. Now he, and, and they have the shorter lifespan of this. Yeah. Opposite yeah. bees who have the long. Now here you have some massive lifespan. You have like uh, enormous uh, longevity. Uh, yeah. uh, not going uh, very little foraging. They have like uh, three times less foraging to four times less foraging trips per day. Uh, yeah. How the, whether whether it, that means that the worker reproductive potential in this lazy species that are not <laughs> self sacrifice foraging whether the reproductive potential of workers there is high and reproductive skew between workers and queen is lower? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, is Francis Rednix is there, we could ask him if he knows any, because he thinks a lot about this. He follows the literature on this probably more closely than I do. So Francis, are you still there? I guess not. So, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole nother perspective on it. And thank you for raising that. Good, to, good follow up, good, be, the good thing to look at. Yeah, we didn't we didn't dissect any workers to find out what kind of variation in reproductive status or state they have. Can I ask? Uh, can I make just a comment? Um, yes, go ahead. I think, uh, I think there's a work that says that um, the ovaries are more developed in Dorsata and Korea compared to Serana and Milifera. Yeah. And, and and we mm -hmm. have kind of found high vitellogelin titers and Apis Gloria workers. Interesting. That is How interesting, it, and, and uh, that uh, that kind of uh, corroborates this point. Hmm? Yeah, it, it, and could that affect their longevity too, having the higher vit yeah. vitellogelin? Could be, could be. I think kind of like what I say, it's, it's multiple functions, right? It's also has something to do with the immunosystem. We don't know it, but we found it, and it was immensely higher 
Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that says something. If I can just briefly jump in. Yeah. Um, it might be the study that we've published on, on the ovary sizes in the different species. And so it's not necessarily ovary development, but ovary size in terms of ovarial number that is huge in dosada and very small in, in uh, fluoria and intermediate in the, in the cavity nesters. Olaf, can you say that again? I didn't quite, I, didn't, I was distracted by something. I didn't quite catch it. Sorry, yeah. So, I mean, we have, I don't know whether that was the reference to this pub publication, yeah. but we've um, looked at different ov ovarial numbers. So the, okay. the potential of workers, not the actual development in terms of yes. are there mature eggs in, in the ovaries, but the size in terms of ovarial number is much larger in the giant honeybees than in the dwarf honeybees and, uh, and the cavity nesters are intermediate. Interesting. Oh, wow. That's, so there's something very interesting going on with, with, with the uh, dorsata. And when you say giant, did you look at laboriosa as well as, yeah. Okay. Just dorsata. So more or more ovarial. Act, okay. Great. Well, that's, that's a mystery. That's a puzzle. That's a good one. <laughs> I wonder why that would be. Oh, huh. uh, one point, sir. One point. Actually, weaker, weaker species enter the cave as that the, the dove. Weaker, weaker species develop high temperature and they enter the cave and they reproduce more. Whereas the bigger ones, which are stronger ones, uh, they reproduce less and they re and they are able to live in the open, open. Besides the weaker species are highly susceptible to the parasite predator. That is why uh, it, uh, it is uh, it uh, entered the caves or the cavities or the uh, nesting pattern in the cavities, etc. To escape from the parasite predator, being it is a weaker species, weaker. Actually, uh, actually the weaker species produces more, reproduce more. Stronger, stronger species they reproduce less. This it may be a point. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I want to ask that uh, I'm sure that your study involved uh, only those bees from natural habitat. Uh, uh, what do you think would happen? in the parameters if uh, you looked at bees that are from hives. Yeah, the serotonin colony, yeah. Uh, cases where open nesting uh, or, or cavity nesting will shift their nesting patterns or uh, behavior under certain circumstances. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, we didn't. Um, our pers the way we were approaching, we didn't we didn't do any investigations along those lines. Um, um, and I, the reason, and the, I'll say the reason is, is we really wanted to see how bees live in in nature in wild. Um, so we wanted because we figured that that's the best way to understand their behavior is to is to understand the is to study them under the conditions under which they've evolved. Yeah, there are, and but as we all know, and as I think your question is, is where it's going is that, yeah, that you can change a lot in the biology of honeybees by changing the, the, the housing that they have. You can, we see that as, as really clearly, that's what a lot of but beekeeping is about, is, is putting bees in, in homes that are very, it's sort of strange. For example, in North America, beekeepers keep their bees in hives that are much larger than the nesting cavities that they would occupy in nature. So they tend not to swarm as much. They develop huge colonies. They store up lots of honey. Yeah, so that is an important line of investigation, but we didn't pursue it at all with the Asian honeybees. We just, um, yeah. And I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew the size of the cavities of the serot that serotonin 
colonies were nesting in. Most of the, I showed one photo of a Serrana colony in a hollow tree, a tree cavity, but that I had just two of those. Most of them were in caves and I couldn't, I couldn't get access to, their, to the size of their nest cavities. Okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, Axel, are there a couple yeah, of questions in the chat that you wanted to answer? So there's a question by uh, Subramian. How does low trip per forager per day in Dosata rela uh, relate to its large comb sizes? Um, I think it relates to it in very indirectly. The, they have a lot of workers per comb area, per unit comb area. And it looks like, um, though I don't know the details, it looks like they're not per B, it's not, um, they're not bringing back many loads of forage. That's what our, but that would be something that really should be examined more closely. Our, our work was so preliminary in so many ways. It was just, we were just trying to get a general broad scale picture. So I have to say, I can't, I, I don't know exactly, but what we saw, certainly the pattern we saw was dorsata workers were making, uh, there were very, only a, a small fraction of the colony was even taking for making foraging trips. But that might've been because of the, partly because of the time of year. These are all questions that need to be looked at on with, by people who are on site year round and get a finer, a much more, detailed view of, um, of the, bi the bee's biology. That's what you guys can do. Yeah, so we did, um, so actually we found that the major foraging uh, time of Apis dorsata mm -hmm. is during the twilight. So it's in the yes. twilight hours. So, and if you haven't measured them during the twilight, you might have got low foraging activity. It's yeah. really kind of what to say. So. It's really like peaks in the morning and in the evening twilight. Yeah. And why do you, do you think that's a way to avoid predators? Because they're big, easy, they're rather big and they're slow flying and make it a little safer for them to go out in, in dusk? So, um, the, okay, I, I'm not an ecologist, yeah? so, but I don't think it has something to do much with predator avoidance because kind of like we have pets here that are flying around, particularly, uh, during evening twilight. So maybe, right. and we don't know whether the foraging activity is actually even higher in the morning twilight. So I would guess kind of like maybe they are going for uh, the rich um, a, a, a nectar and fresh pollen in the morning, maybe. Yeah. Maybe there could be kind of like a slight difference. So I think that um, uh, last week, um, um, uh, Michael Hinscher uh, kind of uh, demonstrated that stingless bees in, in Brazil kind of like have a high foraging activity in the morning. They don't have that in the, uh, in the evening twilight because kind of in the evening twilight temperatures might be still high. Whereas in the morning twilight kind of temperatures are lower. Yeah. So maybe something like that in that direction. I remember Martin Lindau um, paper from the fifties where he was studying dorsata in Ceylon and in India, Sri Lanka and in India. Yeah, he talked about moonlight foraging by, by dorsata. Yeah, okay, we are studying this too, which kind of like that would go too far if I'm talking about that. I it's, great. it's such a cool subject though, it's pretty neat. Yeah. Glad you're looking at it. Okay, so let's kind of like go a, a, a further here, but we have, a, um, questions uh, one tiny point uh, in this whole topic so i mean the uh, the like it there could be this temporal niche partitioning between the three sympatric asian species right yes. so the whole peaks at uh, the twilight peaks of dorsata could be like part of that yes there's certainly their mating flights are, are have different peaks across the day and, and all you know, other activities as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we can 
Um, move on to Joseph. He has been waiting for a while, if he's still there. Uh, hello. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, mine is more of a general question. Uh, since uh, we're talking about two cavity nesting species and one that's up on the tree uh, with a potentially deadly sting, whereas in the case of Floria, they're just out in the open without much of, a, much of a sting. So what is it that works in the case of the Floria bee in terms oh. of uh, defense against uh, predators? Do we know? Thank you. That's a whole nother, that's a subject of a whole nother talk, Joseph, but they are very careful in hiding their nests in deep in vegetation, at least in Thailand. And if during the dry season, if they lose their vegetation cover, they will move their nest and then come back and get the old, the comb, the wax from their old nest to help them build the new nest. Those bees are very good at hiding themselves. They hide themselves away. So their approach is to, um, unlike dorsata, dorsata nests out in the open. It's often, usually, and it's, it can fight back. Little dorsata can't do that very well. And so they, and, but, and by nesting in a shrub, then they're, then they're vulnerable to ants. So they have to collect resins and put down resins to keep the ants from getting to their nests. <laughs> but, so yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. That's right, that's very interesting. interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, then we have uh, one more question by Will Robinson. Oh, yeah, Will. Hi, right, Tom. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, Will. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Speaking. Yeah, it's really good to see you in action again. Looks like you're in the midst of a move by the empty bookshelf behind you. I, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's a bookshelf that needs some, uh, some help. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some old books I could send you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that would be impressive. Yeah, have visitors come in. Yes, I read very widely. <laughs> Lots of I wanted Western to, novels. Yeah, I wanted to weigh in on the longevity question a little bit for Dorsada. Um, I'd like you to, because you know a lot more about it than I do, I think. A little bit. As, as some of you know, I've studied uh, migrating honeybees in northern Thailand and a bivouac. Yeah congregation site where large numbers of bivouacs gather together in the autumn. And uh, one of the things that I found there is I, I measured how long a particular bivouac would stay before it disappeared in this site. And I, as I recall, I don't have the paper in front of me and my memory is faulty, but I think the longest time I ever saw a bivouac stay in the orchard was about 70 days. So a long time, you know, and during that time, the bivouac did not decrease in size, so bees weren't dying, they weren't disappearing. And so it was just, you know, it, it was just a mass of bees. It wasn't a comb or anything. It was just a right mass of comb. resting bees. And yeah, so seventy days of longevity right there is some data for your chart, you know. And uh, the other thing I was doing, at least in a very superficial manner, was to take pictures of the bivouacs at different stages as they stayed. And once again, it looked like the bees weren't aging. You could get, get the same ratio of number of uh, callow bees to aged bees on the curtain. And it would stay the same over four or five weeks, even for the, you know, uh, oh. uh, bivouacs that were staying that long. So just the color of those bees, like Gard was saying, is yeah. really a great indicator of how old they are. And how how they're aging, so I and think there that, is. Yeah, go ahead. There are there are some data out there for how long these things can live, and I think it's clearly it's clear that migrating bees are going to be kind of analogous to diutinous winter bees in mellifera, that are are going to live longer because they're less active. Yeah, yeah, that that certainly makes sense and that would certainly explain your observation that the percentage callos didn't change. Now were those callos how were they distributed in the in the in the cluster? Were they more on the inside than the outside or or not? I would not say so. You know, I was only looking at the surface of the curtain, right? And I would say it was almost random distribution of callos and older bees with with darker uh, abdomens, you know. 
and, but the numbers were about half and half, according to my photographs, about half callows, about half older bees with darker abdomens. This is really primitive natural history, you know. Well, it's that primitive natural history, Will, that cuts new ground, don't you think? <laughs> it's, it's, it's where you, you see stuff that raises questions like, hey, how come, well, yeah, boy, there's a lot, there's a lot of questions there. So, do, yeah, we don't know their ages, but we know we have a sign of their physiological condition. Now, do, remind me, you know more about it than I do. What, what's driving that shift from a callow? It's, it's the exoskeleton is adding, is hardening up or? I wonder, yeah. the, the actual color change? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as, I right. look at this, as I look at them under a microscope, it actually is a darkening of the abdominal hairs. The oh. abdominal hairs are getting blacker and blacker. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's interesting. Which I know surprised Gard. He reviewed one of my papers and, and Gard was surprised at that, but I'm pretty sure about that, that the hairs get darker. I wonder what's going on there. I mean, because you don't see callos on this. I mean, and I'm, I didn't see callow bees on the surface of a nest. And you might think, well, that would be good to be light colored on the surface because you wouldn't get so hot. But that's, uh, but it's, I wonder, hmm. Color change of hairs. Boy, a lot, a lot of the, of, a lot of, on a bivouac, a lot of the curtain bees are callows. And yeah, also a huge percentage of those that are ventilating on the curtain are callows. You can just pick out these really light colored bees that are, you know, fanning their wings. Well, that's a handy marker because those are, and did you, and you wouldn't know because you, you know, we don't know their ages, but you have a, a sense that they're relatively young bees because it's a one-way thing. You don't go from callow to, you, you go from callow to, call to dark. You don't go from dark to callow. Yeah. You know, oh, okay. Again, it seems like very preliminary stuff, but it'd be a fairly easy study just because I think those colors are crying out. I am this old. I, you know, I am I such agree. and such an age. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I, that's really, I'm glad you shared that. Where, where I didn't, I, I somehow, I, 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 where were you in Thailand? You were over on the, on the Western part of Thailand, Northwest? Northwest. Way northwest on the Burmese border, really, Mae Hong Son. And it, yeah, you're up into the foothills of the, of the Himalayas. But at the same time where we specifically were, was only 200 meters. So you're down along a river, not yeah. that far from the, from the sea, really. But it's very, very mountainous country. I wish I were 20 years old. <laughs> I think I'd go there. I think I'd go up I there. Know. Somehow just find a way to live and, and observe and just follow my well, nose. I tried to like, talk you into coming over. <laughs> yeah, Why didn't you come? You know, <laughs> family, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, but the guys and folks in Bangalore, they, they're, they're sort so, of there. They okay. can look hey, at a lot of know. stuff, I hope. So we did an experiment with Apis Gloria where we introduced stayholds into colonies of Apis Loreal. And in those experiments, we also found that uh, very young workers are already appearing at the outside. Mm -hmm. So similar to what has been described in Dosata. What we are yeah. also have seen is by marking bees on the curtain, that the curtain is not quiet. So the bees go in and out yeah. in kind of like so stay out for an hour and then they go in and then they appear at a different side. So it's kind of, I would say kind of like the curtain is a little bit, the idea of the curtain is a little bit misleading. So it's basically yeah. a swarm, right? A yeah. swarm that is hanging around the comb. And, and then kind of like about the dynamics of the swarm, of the colony in the swarm, so to speak, we don't know much. Boy, there's so... The curtains are fascinating, but they they do make it hard to study what's going on in the with the nurse bees, the bees that are tending the brood and things. Do you know anything about their ages and how long they do they interchange between being so, in the curtain versus so being really, on the comb? What to say, right? I mean, you have to open the comb to observe the um, nurse bees, right? 
and right. and the call of course kind of closes very fast and then yeah. kind of like i would just say uh, you cannot approach i mean you cannot do um, these experiments with a colony because then they tend to abscond so uh, okay. yeah but uh, but we did an experiment where we kind of kind of like i, I can send you the paper where we think that even the the um that we have some evidence that uh, the nursing stage uh, is longer in uh, Apis But yeah. I, I so kind of like, I would say it's first result. Yeah, something's got to last longer in those bees to get had so many. But okay, good. But so if you look at, if you look at onset of foraging, uh, it is yeah. that um, you can have kind of workers that are um, starting to forage very early. I, I don't know, four or five days. But basically, mm -hmm. the curve is then broadened. So some can kind of start foraging after 30 days or so. Yeah? So earliest onset uh, of foraging might be the same, but the distribution in which kind of for, uh, workers start foraging is, is uh, way broader. Yeah, and it, it can kind of could have been that in the evolution, this uh, the broadness of this distribution have been kind of shallower, kind of. Yeah, okay. So this is helping us realize that it's not a these aren't discrete age groups at all that are on combs or on cur in curtains. Uh, but it could be yeah. that the the uh, the age demography, so to speak, kind of like you would have a kind of a, a broader distribution and. And I think that kind of like what you say, uh, uh, um, what you said about intermediate bees, right? That that kind of like stage is longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have that as a buffer, right? So yeah, that, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, so is it with dorsata? Is it or filaria? Is it fair to say that most of the foragers are are the oldest bees in the in the colony or? I know you said that not all older, not all of the foragers are elderly bees, and that's what Will reported too. But I wonder if it's. I mean, there's a correlation, of course, that uh, the older you are, the probability that you are a forager is higher, yeah. something like that. Right? Right? It could, you can have kind of like bees that are kind of 40 days old or 50 days old that haven't foraged. And is that nocturnal foraging by, by dorsata? Uh, why only why why only dorsata forages by moonlight and nocturnally? Is okay, so the, uh, the data from Hema Somanata no? that dorsata is kind of uh, has different ocelli and different eyes, and and they are sensitive, so they can fly at low light uh, conditions. Yeah, and I think this is an adaptation uh, to uh, twilight, and and flying in full moon nights is kind of like uh, an epiphenomenon of being yeah. adaptive to twilight foraging. I and it's kind of like what I say, it's not kind of, so if you observe it over the whole year, right? I mean, full moon, it can rain kind of like, and kind of like, so I, I have a student who observed um, uh, moonlight uh, foraging in the, for the last six months. And he only got, um, identified foraging uh, in, in two months. So, so it's not really quite a lot. And we have also compared that um, this study with um, Alison Young, where the foraging activity in twilight is actually way higher than during kind of the night. Yeah. I think yeah. it's kind of like a little bit overstated because of course it's an interesting phenomenon that they uh -huh. fly in the nights, right? But it is not an adaptation to kind of, uh, in my opinion, to, uh, to foraging at moonlit nights. It's kind of like an epiphenomenon to twilight foraging. I see. And are, are they going also to depends. the same? Are they you can also the, Oh, sorry. You, no, no. So you can also see it that it depends on um, whether the, the moon has arisen or not. And kind of like if the moon has arisen, kind of like then the light, uh, um, Intensity yeah. is higher, yeah. so they need the moon to fly, but kind of it's not uh, uh, the adaptation for that. And are they flying to um, flowers that are offering very rich nectar rewards to bats? 
So here it is kind of like what to say, we see it uh, kind of for, um, uh, the, uh, when eucalyptus is flowering. So kind of like, I mean, eucalyptus also a lot of, it's, uh, it's, it, it's unclear with, I mean, we don't know about the pet uh, flowers, but I think kind of like how to say that they probably kind of fl fly to flowers that they also visit during the day. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're not going for specific kind of night flowering uh, um, uh, flowers. Oh, okay. <laughs> particularly, how, how do you say, they, they are going for uh, large, large food sources, yeah? And, yeah. And, and, and so I think kind of like, we see that mainly here when we have also uh, um, flowering um, trees that are also do flowering during the day and, and massive uh, flowering. Okay. There are other people, then Christoph, I see Patrick and then... Uh, the yeah, sheet. so we have uh, next question by Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to go back to this um, intriguing um, relationship between um, nesting behavior and worker tempo or longevity. And um, I want to add some info, um, some um, tell you about some observations Axel, uh, Benjamin and I did, um, which was inspired by your work. Um, we, we did a small test that we um, created an artificial um, open nest in Arbus mellifera. So we, it was a small small experiment, like one replication. We had an Arbus mellifera in a box in the cavity nest with many combs, this typical worker to comb ratio, worker to brood ratio. And we create an artificial open nest with basically making a, an artificial swarm and um, putting it with the queen to a stand where we had one comb with honey, brood, and everything. Just imitating the nest of Epistosata or Gloria. And then the first interesting thing we saw was that um, basically Apis mellifera can maintain this nest, so they don't have a problem with this. Um, they stay there and um, they even maintain this bee curtain, let's say. Yeah. Um, and then what we did was we introduced uh, day olds and um, observed the day olds in the both uh, treatments. And um, in the Apis mellifera open nesting treatment, we really um, 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 yeah, could replicate or um, it, it really um, um, resembled the situ situation in Apis dorsata or Apis loria that we had the bees coming out later, the onset of foraging being later. We even had, when we measured flight activity, they were always foraging less. So um, because earlier we, we discussed about what might be genetic or physiological differences that, uh, um, that determine these behavioral differences like longevity or onset of foraging, so but from these observations, we guess that really a lot of this behavioral variation is only caused by, uh, mechanistically also, just caused by the different nest and, and worker to brood ratio. Yeah, I was going to say, it might not be the nest openness per se, but the effects that that has on things like worker to brood ratio and things like that, that they, yeah, they don't, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, just not working as hard on brooder, and I, I presume because there's a different ratio of workers to, to comb area and brood. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty neat. I, it's you know that um, that might what you were tapping into. I, I'm just thinking it might be highly adaptive for mellifera, even though they don't usually nest in the open. They do sometimes have periods of times when they're hanging out in the open in a swarm cluster, and they're delayed by sometimes ten days to getting to a new home site probably really adaptive to keep things on hold. And so, yeah. Then, where was that published, Patrick? Sorry? Did you publish your results? No, I hope Axel is, um, it's fine for Axel. No, we didn't publish it so far. It's also just one replication. And um, we were also a long time thinking how, um, it, because it's actually ex um, expectable, the result, um, especially based on the work of um, Olaf um, Ripple, um, um, who has some work showing that also the number of young bees um, 
getting added to a colony really influences how at what age do the um, the bees that are already there start foraging and and the onset of foraging determines yeah. the longevity yeah and then when we see like in this open nest treatment we also had lower foraging rate we didn't measure it for individual bees but it can also be that individual bees make less trips in this situation we well, don't think so because yeah they, they, they're not storing nectar so they don't have a really big need for lots of nectar collection and they may not be rearing much per bee there may not be much brood either so there's yeah their needs are foraging needs are probably smaller but it, it's a good example of their of the same mechanisms working uh, sort of in an emergency situation because yeah. it's it, nice, nice that you find it interesting so maybe we'll get back to it and work on it a bit more to publish it did you, did you when you were doing it were you thinking of it at all in terms of a situation of bees in a swarm that have gotten stuck by bad weather yeah that's pretty much comparable i guess right that's what I'm thinking. So, because what you're describing seems very adaptive for bees in that situation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Neat. Well, um, let me know when you, when it's published. I'd like to read the paper. Axel, is there are there questions or comments in the chat that you wanted to mention? So there's someone who is correcting me. Uh, Orav, uh, Oravan says that Dosata do knocked on a flight to visit durian flowers, which opening at night, durian flowers reward very rich nectar. So, yes, I mean, I'd heard I like about that with durian. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see. The, uh... Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, kind of, I think Minakshi kind of, um, she had put a question in the chat, but kind of like, She's raising her hand. Maybe she's asking it herself. Be good. Hi, Professor Seeley. Uh, this is yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, can I go? Can yeah. I go ahead, Axel? All right. Yeah. So, um, so I had a number of questions, uh, but uh, you know, the age-related question was something very interesting because we were trying to uh, carry out these stress-related studies in Apis Dorsetta. And uh, we were trying to figure out whether it had, of course, the first thing we tried to rule out was whether it was directly proportional or there was a correlation between the age and the stress factors. And um, in the process, what we did was um, we tried to uh, capture these bees and then we, and I would love anybody's input on this as well. We tried to capture these bees and then we looked at, uh, first of all, the coloring. Uh, like it was mentioned a couple of minutes ago, where we tried to see the darkness of the um, of the thorax. And we tried to, you know, first of all, track whether this is the age. And what we saw was when we captured it, I, I'm not really sure if it was the fur or like the fuzz on their thorax or if it was uh, what it was. But the, the you know, uh, the colors, like they started to scale off like the, um, like the scales of or the dust of the butterfly wings. So when we put them on ice and then I pick them up, I would have like, you know, their thorax sort of just uh, like wipe off, like, you know, mark off, yeah. you know? Hmm. So I'm not sure if this is, um, and that's when we sort of uh, halted our uh, uh, hypothesis about whether age and the coloration could be correlated because we weren't sure if that would be a good way to track the age. So I have a number of questions, but this is something I would love uh, anybody's input on. Can I just, I want to get, make sure I understand what, how you did your investigations. You were capturing returning foragers? We, uh, we were capturing foraging, actively foraging foragers. Yeah, okay. Right. And, um, and then we, uh, we would bring them back and we put them on an ice bucket or, uh, and uh, that's when I thought, you know, while they are anesthetized, I would try and see the difference between, so I would get multiple foragers back and I would lay them out and I would see if I would be able to, you know, uh, track the discoloration or the coloration. What? what uh, I mean, actually, was it thorax or abdomen? The color. It was the. Uh, it was the. It was the back, sir. Abdomen. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this was something that uh, it would it would be very interesting if we could have inputs on. Yeah. 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 It. Um... 
I guess my main input would be to start by trying to figure out what then what's going on in in an undisturbed colony with the changes in the abdomen coloration. Is it mm -hmm. is it is it um, well, what's the, what Killing the, off there as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That would what be it, interesting. Yeah. And it's 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 not scales coming off, it's ha hairs, correct? Oh, right, right. I mean, uh, that's one thing that I wasn't really sure about, whether it was, you know, sort of uh, like dust, whether it was, you know, uh, like a protein scale, like the butterflies have on their wings, or whether it was the actual hair or the fuzz that was coming off. Uh, but mm -hmm. it was uh, it was a clear uh, discoloration. So if I went by, okay, the thorax is much darker in this bee, so hence older. And then I would, you know, try and look at maybe 10 bees in the same uh, ice bucket. After some time, they started to look the same because, you know, the, um, the colors would start to fade. Or the number of stripes that I saw when I tracked, when I trapped them were not the number of stripes that I would see later. Yeah, then yeah, yeah. It, like if they were hmm, not not really sure, except that yeah, it does sound like they were losing their hairs for some reason. Whether they were just mm -hmm. rubbing against each other, trying struggling mm -hmm. to get out, or somehow the ice affected them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Them hair. Yeah. So I was just I wondering whether that would be a a way or a good way to track their age, you know, um, because that's still quite mysterious. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it certainly could. I think if I were if going forward, I would, I guess I would suggest, well, I know it, I, it's probably ridiculous because dorsata is hard to work with. I, but yeah, it, the, the time and uh, the true technique of labeling newly emerged workers is and tracking their activities and their changes is probably the most reliable way to go forward. Possibly. Also perhaps very challenging, but that would be exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's, I bet there's ways to, <laughs> I'm sure there are ways to do it. Um, mm. But I, uh, yeah, I, but I, I, I don't have enough experience and I understand the challenge to that because the bees are very, you know, they're very attuned to predators coming exactly. up to their exposed nests. And, yeah. um, but can you, does, and I suppose smoking them, which is standard beekeeping technique, mm -hmm. does that help at all deal with, with dorsata or they just explode even more if they get smoked? We haven't really used uh, the smoking technique on dorsetta. So, so far, the experiments we've carried out have usually been with uh, freely foraging dorsetta bees. So uh, we haven't really, uh, we've, ne we've never really exposed them, unlike mellifera. Uh, it's usually we trap them in the field while they're foraging. So yeah. it, has not, it right. hasn't really been a factor. You have also uh, taken from the be. hive, no? Uh, we've taken from the hive, but without smoking. Yeah. We directly collected it with a, a contraption. Yeah. yeah. I know the honey hunters, when they do Apis laboriosa, they use smoke. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, I think some, I guess the tech, I mean, the really, the only, I think the only, it's going to be essential that somebody figures out a way to label newly emerged yeah. workers. Because if we hadn't done that with no effort, we wouldn't really know what the patterns are. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, definitely. Fortunately, the newly emerged bees are callows, so they, they are distinctive, at least in, well, I don't know, in, in Malifera, I mean, in Dorsada. Oh, mm -hmm. I hope so. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sidi. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Then we have, we just had a question by Gard Otis, but I think he... Uh, removed his hand. So then we have another question um, by an S. Lecho Manani. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I am from South India, southern part and the Western Ghat area. Mm -hmm. Here, tribals use a particular um, a sound to bring down the swarming bee 
particularly APIS data, uh, DOS data. I wondered mm -hmm. by that kind of sound, the swarm, the entire swarm landed immediately on the nearby tree. They stayed there for three or four days. I tried to do the same. Immediately the tribals warned me, it is very dangerous, don't try this. Have you heard about this? No, but I have tried it with Apis mellifera because beekeepers here, if they see a swarm leaving their hive, they think they will induce the swarm to settle by banging you know, two metal things together and making a, sharp, a sound like that. We, we did that experimentally. We didn't see any effect, but that's Apis mellifera. So I, I'm intrigued that you're finding with Apis dorsata, it does seem to work. And yes, actually, I have seen the entire swarm landed suddenly upon a tree at a hand reach level. I went to see nearby. Immediately, the tribals shouted, don't go there. It is very, very dangerous. But you don't try also. I, I, I want to know about this. I, I guess my, my first thought is you'll have to do you have to do some cases of swarms where you don't do the make the sound, the tanging sound, the banging, and see if if they also settle. I mean, it's it's one of those cases where you need a controlled experiment because some swarms are going to just settle all on their own, regardless of whether anybody's making a sound. And that's the so that's the challenge. They did. The, they did. Sorry, they did some clapping of the hand and then some sound, vocal sound. Immediately, the entire swarm landed. No one, I think, had experimented on this. I tried to do it, but the tribals warned me severely. If it hands nearby you, it will be too dangerous. So I didn't try. Yeah, yeah. See, the, the reason I think a lot of people are skeptical about this, though it's really it's just skepticism, is we don't, we don't have any indication that at least in Apis mellifera, that the bees have any ability to hear pressure sound. They hear sounds when they're really close to another bee, like if a bee in the nest doing a waggle dance, because there they can pick up the, it's what's called part of the air, they can actually sense the particle, the movement of the air particles. Um, and they can sense that on the hairs of, on their head and things like that. But they, with, when it's pressure sound, then when sound Maybe. When you're detecting pressure sound as a pressure wave you know we can do it because we have eardrums and, and and other animals have eardrums that do that but bees don't have eardrums so we're it's kind of puzzling but i guess the starting point would be to try to do really a good comparison of the effects of this banging uh, of doing trailing flareborne swarms with and without the banging seeing if there's a difference in the speed with which they settle. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. It's an interesting topic. Um, oh. Oh, Axel, um, are there still so, questions? A couple of questions left. I, I guess we can slowly move towards um, wrapping the seminar up. God has still a hand raised. Yeah, I, I, I thought there might still be something in the in the chat, but then if, if not, um, then maybe Gard and Vidur, and then I would say um, we we end for today. Okay, thanks. Uh, just really quickly, years ago there was a small report about how uh, tribal people in the Andaman Islands use a plant in the, I think it's the Ananaceae family, and they smear the plant all over their hands and they can go up and put the crushed plant near the colonies of Apis dorsata. And the photos show the bees just completely moving off of the comb and exposing mm -hmm. what's underneath. Um, mm -hmm. This has never been followed up on either for management of bees or for being able to access and look at the combs and see what's happening. And oh, it would be Lord. amazing to extract this chemical and get somebody, a good chemist to identify what it is and then see if it actually can be used for management of bees in general or 
and specifically for removing, for gently getting the bees to leave the comb of Apis dorsata. So you can quantify things like brood numbers and stuff like that, and then allow the bees to just move back onto the comb. It's just a general comment. People who are there and have the plant available, uh, go for it and figure out what is going on. And I know that some people in botanical gardens grow the plant outside of the Andaman Islands. I think there was a place in the Western Ghats that was growing it. So it isn't like you have to go far, far, far away off to Eastern India to get the plants. They're available elsewhere. There you go. And okay. great talk. And thanks for all the ideas from everybody. This was a very interesting exchange of ideas. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Can I make a comment on that? Can I make a comment on that? Chemical trick. So, since I'm here in, in Bangalore, I've been asked to, um, to follow up studies on that or from three different people. And we finally did some experiment, kind of like a master thesis at, um, at the agricultural um, university. And indeed, kind of like so, an extraction, water extraction of that plant compound has the effect that the bees are kind of. Um, kind of retracting. Um, <clears throat> but then I was told by my PhD supervisor that even kind of for Apis mellifera, some um, beekeepers use odors to calm them down or kind of to do the retraction. And, and so we use Neroli and with Neroli we had the same effect. So, so how to say there is kind of like, you, there might be several uh, odors that can be used in that way. And, and, and I mean, so it was kind of a master thesis, kind of like some, it's more like a pilot study, but, uh, but that can be used, the order. Um, we, I think we mostly uh, uh, use gentle smoking if we work with the dosata colony. Yeah. And kind of like how to say, so I think that, okay, so kind of like, I think it's more like personal decision, whether one thinks smoking is worse or odor treatment is worse, right? With odor is always a problem. It's like a contaminant. I mean, you never know where you leave it and where you have it. So, but, Good point. Um, but the effect is kind of like um, um, uh, uh, interesting and good. So, but, but one can also use other odors. Yeah, it, um, yeah, yeah. Smoke is good because we can smell it really well, so we know it's gone. <laughs> but um, maybe this other compound is good in that regard too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's that is. With those tools are critical with these come with the curtain bees, curtain nesting bees. Yeah. Then, Vitor, you have the privilege of asking the last question. Haha. <laughs> Cool. So uh, the deal is, uh, so considering, you know, there are various contexts where there are piping sounds emitted by bees. For example, two virgin queens actually emerge at the same time. Then they are, then like I've heard they do this piping vocalization to locate each other so, so that they can like fight. And in other contexts also, I've seen a distressed worker. I've I myself have anecdotally seen on an occasion or two a distressed distressed Serana workers making like a piping vocalization and not really when they were in close contact with like other bees. So, uh, so I mean, perhaps uh, like conventional vibrational sound could be detected by like the Johnston's organ or something, at least of some specific frequencies. That's just a uh, food for thought. I'm kind of like yes. put, putting out there. Yes, so we know in a, yeah, that's, I'm glad you pointed those things out that they, if you've seen those in the apis species, we know they exist in apis mellifera. Um, one is a, one is a piping signal where the bee walks along. Um, it's an activational signal. It's, um, my brain's a little fuzzy on them, I, even though I studied them and published the papers on them. Um, a bee will come over to another bee in preparation for swarming, for example, press her thorax against, against the other bee, which is cooler, and the bee will make a piping sound by activating her flight muscles. And that tells the bee to warm up and get ready. Um, they will also do that to the queen, um, pipe the queen, and it sounds a lot, it sounds a bit like the queen piping. Um, so that we call that the piping signal. 
Uh, there are some, and there there are some other lots of acoustical signals that um, that go on in there. There's um, another one is. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just drawing a blank right now. But yeah, there's a lot of there's, and these are we we hear them as sounds, but the, for the bees, they're mechanical signals. They are transmitted through the comb or directly into the body of the other bees, not through the sounds. Yeah. Okay, so like even two virgin queens at like opposite corners of a hive, uh, the piping could entirely be conveyed through the combs or through the like wall of of the of the, the hive or, or a com combination. Is that a possibility? Like yeah, that's, that's that's right. When you if you watch a queen when she pipes, she's pushing her abdomen, her thorax, very hard against the comb. Um, yeah, she's probably not reaching bees that are a queen that's on another comb, but she that sound will get to other queens that are nearby her. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it comes back to that question of whether they have can hear airborne sound they, and they can they can they can do it, they can hear they can hear sounds if if they're close enough to the sound source that their antennae are caused to vibrate, but they don't have a they don't have an eardrum structure like we do and, and, and other mammals do. Right, right. Of course, I was only speaking in terms of the John, Johnston's organs. I mean, we know insects that can actually hear through the Johnston's organ, like mosquitoes. Right. Yes, that's causing the antennae to vibrate, and then yeah, that's right. And when a bee does a waggle dance, that's part of how the Bees that follow the waggle dance orient to the waggle dancer. They can they can feel um, the, the pressure waves that are produced by the waggling motions themselves uh, through their antennae, through the and thus through the Johnston's organ. Yeah. Okay, so just two more tiny points. So like when a I guess maybe when a distressed to worker that's stuck in a frame or like stuck under the high blade, I guess those if, if I think I've sometimes heard those pipes. So I guess maybe that is again mechanically conveyed through the uh, through the hive box, etc. But one different thing I saw is uh, this is literally a single an anecdote. I was trying to make Serana foragers fly in a tunnel, and one of them kind of got stuck in like the adhesive between the a uh, mesh I, I was attaching, and it was just going, and it was stuck, and it was like kind of moving around and like piping so but uh, but i wonder if maybe it could sense it was on a so, so, solid surface where there were other but yeah that is one example it was removed from the hive but it was piping in distress so are you sure it was making a, a piping signal or was it just frantically move trying to um Frantically moving its wings in, in a very high in a high frequency and getting a higher. Yeah, than... I mean the latter is definitely a possibility. All I knew is that it sounded like it was like, mm, 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 mm. but I guess that could have just been a sign of like struggle because its wings were like all stuck. So I guess that. Yeah, hard to say. I would guess it's probably the wings, but the sound you just produced is is that frequency of about two hundred and fifty hertz, which is the piping sound frequency. It's not far from the wing beat frequency either, though. So that's a, you know, they can sound similar, but the, um, uh, but one is one is and the and the sounds that get loaded into combs. If you're really close to them, they you can hear them yourself because the combs vibrate the air enough. So it, it gets a little. Um, but generally speaking, the the ones that they make with the thorax. Not with the not with the not moving their body or their wings. Those are those are the ones that um, are hard to hear unless you have a you're very close to the source. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for those observations. It's yeah the whole the whole uh, acoustical aspect of bee communication. Um, used to not be well studied, but now with, with the tiny little microphones, uh, which, we usually, which were developed for hearing aids, actually, it's able, we're possible to measure vi vibrations and, uh, and airborne, both comb substrate and airborne vibrations very precisely. And it's turned, opened up a lot of 
uh, clarified a lot of signaling that's that we didn't know about before mostly yeah and so i'm sure there's fascinating things with the asian honeybees probably maybe even different ones different problems different issues Okay, so Tom, thank you very much for giving us so much time. Um, thanks to the audience for uh, lively discussion and lots of interesting and good ideas for many years of research. Um, yeah. yeah, I hope that's that's the main thing I hope will come from this is it, is is just encouragement to to study those fascinating Asian honeybees. They are. And if, and I guess the other thing is a comparative perspective can be really helpful, mm -hmm. really helpful. And the, to think and to sort of get into the mindset, oh, I'm dealing with a cavity nesting bee or I'm dealing with an open nesting bee. What are, what are the kind of adaptive, what are the problems that, it, that each one has given those two nesting situations? Lots of defense, <laughs> need a lot of defenders covering the combs in one case and mm -hmm. not so many in the other. Good. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to be invited. It's, Thank you very much. It's, and it's good to see you again, Christoph, and also Likewise. Axel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, a good day to everyone, or a good evening for those where it's a bit later. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.